Welcome to the African American Library at the Gregory School. My name is Erica Thompson. I'm the community liaison here. And on behalf of our entire staff and our manager, Daniel Burns Wilson and Miguel Caesar, who's over there, <laughs> just want to say thank you for coming out and welcome to our space. We, um, I don't know that I have the words to express how meaningful our partnership is with the Center for Public History at University of Houston. I, I am getting a little embarrassed about the love fest that happens when I do these introductions because it's, it's just so rewarding for us uh, to be able to work with the caliber of professionals and academics and administrators in that space who bring um, the love and passion of educating the community on history to our space and to our patrons. And so it's very meaningful for us. We cannot be thrilled. They say, hey, you would do this? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. So it's, it's great for us. And we're so appreciative that you all are joining us to join in this lecture tonight. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Leandra Zarno, who's going to introduce our speaker for tonight. But before I do, I want to just big up, big plug for our 10th anniversary symposium, which will be taking place November 15th and 16th here at the Gregory School, actually on our property to adjacent to us in the green space. Um, it's going to be a state of black Houston um, symposium exploring all aspects of life in the city through the lens of the black community. It's two days full of programming, capping off with a documentary screening of Ben DeSoto's work um, and a Q&A with Ben DeSoto. So we really hope that you all can join us. Um, if you want inf more information, you can see me after the event. But for now, I'm going to turn this over and we're getting prepared for what is going to be a magical evening. So thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Sarah. Thank you. Well, let's continue this love fest and <laughs> say that the Gregory School is a really important place for the Center for Public History as well. Um, not just for these kinds of events, for our students as well. And so my class actually came here last week and for uh, of the 16 students, 14, it was their first time in this space. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about how the exhibits were put together and how meaningful it is to be one of five African-American libraries of this kind in the country. And so for, for those students who are learning how to be public historians, um, this was a really powerful moment. Uh, so thank you all for making this space happen. And um, the Center for Public History is also having um, a really important moment of uh, reevaluation of our uh, contribution to the city. And so I wanted to just share a vision statement that we wrote recently. To ignite an understanding of our diverse past by collaborating with and training historically minded students, practitioners, and the public through community driven programming and scholarship. So we sat around the table and we thought about what do we want to be and, and do for um, Houston and how do we want to engage um, our uh, partners as Houstonians. And so this, I think, is going to move our um, program forward as we hope to have kind of a long. Um, relationship with a lot of community partners like all of you in the room. So thank you for that. Um, and so if you're interested in what we're doing, we have a Facebook um, page at UHCPH or a Twitter at UHCPH History. Or if you just Google Center for Public History, you can find out what we're doing. We have really interesting projects. Um, Resilient Houston, for instance, we're trying to capture all the stories of people that went through Harvey um, and, and other oral history um, projects like that. And I also want to draw attention to our co-sponsor for the evening, the University of Houston's Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program. And um, they're really focused on oral history and capturing history as well. And so we have a Living Archive series, and they also just in, um, launched a spin-off uh, think tank that is called the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality. And it's mainly about uh, really engaging uh, Houston-based research in the area of gender studies. So thank you um, to that sponsor as well. And I really, uh, it's really my incredible pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Amy Earhart, um, who is an associate professor of English and affiliated faculty of Africana Studies at Texas A&M University. Um, and her talk this evening is called The Millican Massacre, Recovering the Past, Documenting for the Future. And this really reflects her uh, dual interest in uh, public history and engagement and her orientation as a digital humanist um, or a digital humanities scholar, which basically means that she likes to work in the web zone uh, and will show us how that is important this evening. Um, she's working on a book project that's called Can a Computer Be Racist? 
Digital Humanities and the Exploration of Race, and her prior publications include Traces of Old, Uses of the New, The Emergence of Digital Literacy Studies, and a lot of um, journal articles in journals like Debates of Digital Humanities, Textual Cultures, the Humanities, and the Digital, and it's really interesting, engaging material, and I'm sure that she's going to knock our socks off tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <All> right. pressure. <laughs> Let's see. Can you all hear me? Does this need to be on, do you think? Does this need to be on? Yes, it is. There we go. How's that? Better? Yeah? Okay. No? Yeah? Okay. I want to make sure you can all hear me. There's nothing worse than being the person in the back and kind of wondering. It's really wonderful to be here. I can't say how wonderful it is. I'm looking around the room and seeing so many people I've met before, and I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming out. Thank you for the, for the invitation, the kind invitation from the Gregory School. Um, thank you for the folks from University of Houston. I've had a great two days there. Um, the graduate students, undergraduate students from the University of Houston have been amazing. I see some of them in the room. They've been amazing students. I've been glad to hear about their projects. Um, I spent this afternoon at the Arte Publica Press. Um, and uh, the work they're doing there to recover um, a very broad uh, cross-section of Latino publications, of Latino newspapers and creative expression materials. Um, they really have been doing this for a very long time and, and, and it's truly um, amazing to see the work they're doing. Um, and I also want to make sure that I thank um, all the community partners who I've met over the years. Um, you've all really taught me so much about um, the kind of work that I should be doing and could be doing. Um, you've given me um, your knowledge and I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate all the work you've done. And so it seems to me that we're at a time of great national turmoil and a moment when the violence, individual and state against black Americans as this becomes more apparent to the larger country, um, the histories of this part of Houston and the centrality of the Gregory School in those Houston um, stories and in those histories is so needed. Um, so I hope that um, there will be more and more of this public um, community partnership. All right, so that said, um, I decided when I was putting this, this talk together, it's a, it's a little, it's a little hard because I'm working with two very different audiences. So I bookended the talk in the front and the end with some of the sort of more theoretical work that I'm doing with archives and preservation. And then I'm going to put a nice big chunk of the Millican massacre history in the middle because I know a lot of our community partners are very interested to learn um, what else we found about that project. So what I want to do is sort of ground my work and how I think about these kinds of projects in some theoretical ideas. And most important to me, I think, when I'm thinking about these projects is the idea of intersectionality. Um, and this is a term that was coined by, termed by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. And what it basically says is that um, experiences within this matrix of interconnectedness and complex systems of privilege and oppression. So it's, it's suggesting that race, gender, gender, sexuality, class, and ability must all be considered. These are all tangled together, and you can't pull one string and untangle that and understand the system unless you look at these all together. Um, and part of this for me is really thinking through my positionality in relationship to the work I'm studying. Um, and this has become very clear over the years. I, I started out as a trained African-American scholar, and it really became clear early on that I had to think about my position as a white woman who is engaging with this material and to be really honest about what that meant. So I want to start with sort of thinking about positionality of myself, the field I work in of Texas A&M, the institution I work in, um, and then move forward into thinking about um, the Millican Massacre. So, of course, as I was writing this talk, the news regarding Tatiana Jefferson's murder in her own home by a police officer broke. And for those of us that understand that violence attached to racism is foundational to the U.S., this was unfortunately no surprise. Jefferson's murder must be understood as a part of a long history, one that stretches back to the foundational sin of enslavement, which positioned violence as a means to obtain power and goods. Jefferson's life cut short is one of one more point of a long and bloody arc that includes the Millican Massacre that I will be discussing tonight. We're only beginning to engage with this history and its consequences, but documentation and analysis must include unearthing the many moments that combine to create a legacy of violence for gain. 
This important work is underway by groups including the Equal Justice Initiative, for example, which serves to document not only lynching incidents, but the terror and trauma, the sanctioned violence against the black community created. Or the recent 1619 project by Nicole Hannah Jones, which is this amazing project she put together through the New York Times, which documents the connections of enslavement to current systems of oppression. Her piece on um, the connection between enslavement and prisons is very moving and, and well worth reading. In addition to documentation of this history, we must also consider the continued legacy of sanctioned violence in relationship to our current scholarly analysis, a difficult journey for scholars, but without which effective community partnerships remain unattainable. The structures in which we do our scholarship, in which we correct, collect these rare textual materials into archives, the structures that allow us to labor to build digital collections and archives are all entwined with these histories. Histories that are inescapably bound up with the potential re-commodification of black life, as Jessica Johnson and Vincent Brown, among other scholars, remind us in their work. So the first part I want to talk about is positionality, or as I say, can we trust the university? Um, yes, exactly. So digital humanities work is increasingly outward facing, community and activist oriented. However, the historical abuses of communities and systematic inequalities present formidable challenges for those who seek to develop partnerships with historically exploited populations. Excellent work in negotiating this long-standing problem is occurring in pockets of digital humanities work, with scholars working in indigenous studies leading the way. However, I think we still need to develop a set of best practices, recognizing that an understanding of individual and group situatedness is crucial to our practices. Such approaches involve, involve both introspective and a historical understanding of the power dynamics within institutions and communities. So for the first part of the talk tonight, I want to position myself, my university, my academic field, and my work. Each of these nodes will impact my ability to work with the community, with community organizations. And this approach, which is really common among scholars who practice intersectional feminist scholarship, might strike those outside the academy as a bit of an odd way to begin a collaboration, as such introspection is increasingly rare, I think, in public discussion. To me, though, in the way I imagine my work, this is the point in which I must always begin. So here I want to reference a recent conversation that occurred on Twitter during the Enduring Slavery, Resistance, Public Memory, and Transatlantic Archives Conference, which was recently held at the New York Schoenberg Center. Um, and I did ask this, this particular young scholar's permission um, to show his work. I always ask, even though it's Twitter and it's public, um, and he, was, he said, great, I'm happy to share um, my perspective. And while the panels were wide ranging, several dealt with how we might reckon with slavery in both national and university settings. And this tweet for me was incredibly powerful. As a white woman who's worked with African American literature of enslavement and violence for over 20 years, it has long been important for me to think about my position and how I respond to the materials that I'm investigating. One of the most moving and important moments of my teaching career was to come face to face with this legacy. And interestingly enough, the student that really brought this question to the fore was from this very neighborhood. Um, and I still think of her really fondly. She's come back to Houston and she's still engaged with community activism work. Um, when my department said, you know, hey, we want to put you up for a teaching award, go get some letters from former students. So I asked this former student because I knew she was doing great work in Houston. And she wrote this amazing letter that really made me sit and think. And I just want to read you a few of her words. And I think they relate to this tweet about um, how white scholars need to really think about where they are in this history. Um, she talks about going to Texas A&M and what a, what a culture shock that was in some ways for her. And she said, the following summer I enrolled in an African American literature course with Dr. Earhart, a red-headed white woman who was about to give me my first real history lesson in the greatness of blackness. My initial surprise and bewilderment after meeting her was etched into my face. We read Clotel. One of the first works that we studied was about the narrative of Thomas Jefferson's black children, written by William Wells Brown. <clears throat> I wrote about how a piece of work of such magnitude may have later impacted American society. I felt the stinging of a history of oppression. 
I remember being angry that a white woman was telling me about my history. Later, we studied Harriet and Jacob's incidents in the life of a slave girl. I learned that while there were several runaway slaves that were ultimately caught, some made it out to read, write, and detail the horrors of slavery. I analyzed how the text was written to appeal to white women of that day, hoping to evoke sympathy for the inhumane acts afflicted upon slave women. I remember wondering if Professor Earhart's family had ever owned slaves. And I really sat with that for a long time. She made me really think about my position. She continues by talking about how she realizes that what she thought of as her history um, and of her response to this white instructor knowing and teaching her history then became a means of her thinking through her black history as something that she wanted to learn about and a history that could be both of ours, but in different ways. Um, and, and that was such an important moment for me, I think, as an instructor. And it let me really think through the kinds of conversations I needed to have with my students. Um, and I also knew that one can't teach and research from a neutral position in the society that we have today. It is not possible. For my student, as she wrestled with the rest of the, the ideas in the rest of her letter, there was a knowledge that she had been shut out of her own history while this white woman who carried all the privilege of position was lecturing her about the history. And she saw that class as a challenge to learn more and to teach more. And I think it's that complex engagement and honesty that we have to begin with. But while the personal is also political, the institutional structures that we work within are ever present and an individual analysis doesn't suffice when we talk about community partnerships. And Mr. Harrison taught me this. I think more than anyone, he taught me this. I had a conversation with him about when he had last been to Texas and AM's campus and he said, World War II, and I didn't want to come back. He taught me something really important. It was a gift. And he did come back, and I was really honored that he would trust enough to come back. Um, the institution that employs me, the institution that I'm affiliated with, Texas A&M, also has a history that needs to be excavated, that we must sit with. Opened in 1872, Texas A&M University was very much a product of the violent, segregated environment from which it arose segregated, and I think the important thing is that it was segregated only against um, black students, that there were actually a number of South and Central American students, Latin American students who attended um, prior to segregation. It was segregated until 1963, and it's still known, of course, as a school which is conservative politically and certainly not welcoming to minority students. Um, you know, I'm sure you've all heard about the 2016 harassment of a group of high school students that visited the campus and they were taunted with the um, Confederate flag. In a state which will soon be majority minority, Texas A&M is like many predominantly white institutions in the United States. And I wanna think about this history in relationship to community partnerships in a bit more detail later in my talk, but I wanted to sort of lay this out as another piece to this puzzle. Beyond these institutions, the very fields that we work within must be examined. And I've talked to some of you about this today. Um, we have to think about the way these intersectional um, ideas have to be in a continual negotiation because digital humanities itself has had a repeated exclusion of consideration. Now there's a growing body of work that challenges digital humanities to do better including work by, work by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein, who use theories of intersectionality to call for data feminisms, Rupika Rizm, who expands post-colonial theory into the digital humanities in her book, New Digital Worlds, and Elizabeth Loesch's and Jacqueline Vernamont's recent Bodies of Information volume. But we still have a distance to go. Archives occur within these human-built institutional structures, but are also developed within the technological infrastructures that shape and reshape the types of archives that we might create. The narrative of technology is, of course, that it's liberatory, it's democratizing, it's a tool for us to use against oppression. But the problem is that the underlying technology systems have hardwired racial assumptions built into them, and we need to think about what that means. From simplistic systems such as the Western-oriented spell check in word processing programs to structural descriptions of technology functions, um, one example is that um, people often talk about a master-slave usage in device control in computers. 
Computers are built on this binary system to artificial intelligence that discounts black faces. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And the production mechanisms that drive this kind of scholarship, we are working within a structure, a hardware system that produces racialized understandings of culture. And here I want to um, mention some really amazing work um, by Joy Bulalamwini, who's a researcher at the MIT Media Lab. And she's done this amazing work on facial recognition software. And what she's found is if you stand in front of a facial recognition software, it does not recognize black faces. She has a white mask she puts on her face and it recognizes her. So what is it when the entire structures are built on these assumptions? And she has a great little TED talk, so um, I'll put these slides up later if you're interested in her. Um, you can go and find her work, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, another, another work that I wanna point to um, that I think is also really interesting is a recent book um, by Saifa Noble called Algorithms of Oppression. And she's looking at the very algorithms, the Google searches, and she's looking at how they um, construct race and gender. So if you, if you, it's a little hard to see, but there's, it's a Google search bar, and she types in black women are, and then looks to see what the automatically generated responses are, and you might imagine what they are. So it's hardwired into these systems. So what does it mean to try to do something that is going to resist oppression within these systems itself? And that's the kind of question I'm asking in um, my book project. So given this, we might ask if we can achieve a broad and accurate narrative of race within a structure that is built on racist cultural assumptions. As Rapika Rizm reminds us, for digital humanities, using these technologies raises a question of complicity with the reproduction and amplification of normative forms of human subjectivity. That these technologies reinforce the notion that there are normative and singular ways of being human in the first 20th cent 21st century. I first want to acknowledge the problematics of the term archive. Um, Ashley Farmer has written this great article called Archiving While Being Black. And she talks about the weight of being the only person of color in the room surrounded by images and artifacts of America's favorite colonizers while waiting for the staff to bring out research materials. And I think that I have to say that's what I think is amazing about the Gregory School. It resists that. It does not do that. And that's so important. And while we might try to solve the problem of archiving while black with increased hiring of black archivists and researchers, these archives, housed in predominantly white institutions, remain infused with exclusionary signals. And I will say it makes a difference that we are fortunate to have Rebecca Hankins as our Africana Studies Collection Librarian. And I've worked closely with, with Rebecca. I know some of you have met her. Um, she has made a huge difference in the kind of materials we collect in outreach to community. Um, and I have to say, she was also appointed by President Obama in 2017 as a member of the National Historical Preservations and Records Commission. Now, she has not been back since the changeover. <laughs> but we are very pleased that she was honored by President Obama. And because of Rebecca, we have a Black Radicals collection. We have very rare Malcolm X materials that my students have worked with and digitized. We actually have this really fascinating collection of Elridge Cleaver papers. Um, we have letters from Cuba denouncing racism in Cuba. Um, we have love letters that he wrote to his white lawyer when he was in prison. And even oddly enough, we have ephemera from his clothing line. We have clothing tags he developed and, and never finished. You know, he never went through the process, but he's got the tags. Um, and we even have pants designs, like full body, bell bottoms, bell buckle pants that he had designed. Um, we have a newspapers. We have Black Panther newspapers. We have amazing church records. I know some of you have looked at the history of black churches in Texas records that we have. Um, we have all these amazing collections, yet we have to remember at Texas A&M that these collections are housed in the very same building as Klan robes that were worn by the members of the Texas A&M University faculty and staff, including this one, which was worn by Coach Dana X. Bible, who was our most winning football coach, 1917 to 1919 to 1928. He also coached Mississippi College, LSU, Nebraska, and UT, and he's in the College Football Hall of Fame. 
We know this is his because it has his name embroidered into the robe. Now, of course, if you do a search for clan robes, you're not going to find them in our catalog. It's a hidden history. But what I find fascinating is our students know. They tell each other. They tell each other these histories which often get buried. And my feeling is that we can't let this history be something that our black students alone bear. We need to have a discussion about these histories and grapple with them and come to terms with them. And here I also want to highlight another sort of lens with this. Um, Jarrett Drake's work on archivists and archives is really interesting. Um, he wrote a blog in 2017 where he said, I'm leaving the archival profession, it's better this way. And he wrote, the purpose of the archival profession is to curate the past, not confront it, to entrench inequality, not to eradicate it, to erase black lives, not to ennoble them. And he announced that he was going to move on to starting a PhD in anthropology. And since then, he's done a lot of amazing community archivist work um, on black lives uh, protest and collective um, identities. Um, and so he's challenging us, I think, to take seriously this, this idea of, is it possible to do this kind of work within certain spaces? And that's why, again, I want to sort of praise the Gregory School, because I think it's a special place. Um, and I'm thinking about the vibrant community that surrounds this school. All right, so now I get to the history part. So I said I bookended these. So now I want to talk about archiving with community pro uh, with our community partners, many of who are in the room today, um, and sort of to spin out um, some of the histories that we're working with. Um, and again, this is having those difficult conversations that we need to have to move forward. Um, and you know, I also want to have a little uh, a little thank you, especially to Reggie Brown, who has worked tirelessly with this project who really is the reason that this project has now been awarded, hopefully, a Texas historical marker to, um, to, to really make sure that the public understands this particular event. So, on to Millikan. The Millikan riot, or massacre, of 1868 archives materials related to the July 1868 event that occurred in Millikan, Texas, which is a very small town located 15 miles south from Texas A&M University, a massacre that may well have been one of the largest so-called race riots in Texas. Um, there's always a debate over what does large mean. Let's just say it was, it was, it was horrifically large. Um, this, this event was a, it, it sort of was a series of events that occurred during the summer of 1868, which exploded on July 15th to 17th, and led to white violence designed to control and contain black civil rights with a particular goal of ending black voter rights. As Henry E. McCulloch, Texas Revolutionary Soldier, Confederate Brigadier General, Texas Ranger, and Texas politician stated in response to the Milliker Massacre, I will take occasion to say in conclusion that white men established and have maintained this government that it is a white man's country which is titled to and must have a white man's government under the control of white voters and officers elected by them and that I am utterly opposed to Negro suffrage in any form as it must lead ultimately to Negro equality to which I will never quietly submit. Yes, the tension in Millican and Brazos County was exacerbated by a lot of shifts in population. So I'm sort of going to give you a little bit of the backstory that leads up to this event. Um, prior to the Civil War, the enslaved population exploded. Um, a lot of folks who um, were in, uh, were involved with white plantation owners who enslaved people would move to Texas, especially along the Brazos River and the rivers, because they felt it was a safer place and that they would be less likely to have slavery ended. Um, and by 1860, the town's population was 40% enslaved persons. Post-Civil War, freedmen and women were moving in and out of Milliken quite rapidly. There was a lot of sort of turnover, and often folks were searching for their loved ones separated during slavery. And one of the amazing things I found was that Perry Downs, who was the half-brother to Frederick Douglass, Douglass talks about Perry briefly in his autobiography, um, he was one such person who moved to Milliken looking for his wife. And, um, no, no problems. And um, he found his wife in Milliken. It, it, you know, you find all these 
um, ads posted post-Civil War looking for um, lost loved ones, and most people never found their loved ones. Perry Downs found his wife in Milliken, which is quite amazing to me. Um, the large number of newly freed African Americans, combined with the loss of voting rights for most white Texans, signaled a dramatic shift in the town's fortunes. Um, Milliken began to diminish. The railroad expanded north past Milliken in 1866, and lots of businesses just went with the railroad. Um, in 1867, the population of Milliken was further reduced by a yellow fever epidemic. It was on the bottoms. Um, and by 1868, Milliken had only 1,200 residents who were predominantly black. Like many cities in the South, and particularly across the Confederacy, uh, the white minority viewed the black majority as threatening and exerted control through violence. Federal troops had arrived in Milliken in June of 1865, um, but there were eventually four stationed in Milliken, not really an army force, um, and um, there's letters that suggest that um, a they, they even saw the federal soldiers beyond just being federal troops as problematic because there were a lot of um, black and non-commissioned soldiers that came through with, with the army. So all this is kind of going along in the background. Meanwhile, the black community was registering to vote at a rapid pace. Um, Stephen Curry, who is one of the folks that we've talked about um, pretty um, extensively with this project, he was elected to represent Millican citizens at the Texas Constitutional Congress. Um, a new black school began, and all the local white politicians, except for the coroner, had been removed from office and replaced. Um, because they were con aligned with the Confederacy. All right, so this is all churning in the background. A series of events eventually lead to white violence that was designed to end black voting. And I think in a way that that's not surprising, um, given that this area was known as a hotbed of lynching. Um, for example, one person reported during this period that there have been more murders committed within this district upon persons of Freemans. And he went to um, denote that he had recorded six murders within a six month period. And that's from the Freedman's paper. Okay, um, I just wanted to point this out. Um, this, was, this was Nathan Randlett. He was the white soldier, the white Union soldier that was sent to run the Freemans Bureau. He will be an interesting figure later on. He's buried in New Hampshire, he's from New England. Um, George Brooks, who I mentioned, he's, and we'll talk more about in a minute, he was rapidly um, registering folks to vote. We have the voter registration um, rolls so we can see this growing voter registration um, for the black community. I mentioned Stephen Curtis, who's a really important figure as well. Um, he was a central figure to the Millican riot Post, um, post the end of the Millican riot, and I'll talk more about him in a minute. Um, just some statistics I wanted to point out, if you look. Um, they do some sort of violence ranking in this book. Basically what it turns out to be is Brazos County was the most violent county in Texas at this moment. Um, it really was a place in which um, a lot of, a lot of um, there was a lot of assertion of rights that were then met with violence. Okay, um, and we have the Freeman's Bureau's records which back us up. This is a full list of Freeman's Bureau reports that document violence in Texas at this time. And these are not just single, single reports. These will be like you pull up the document and you have 50 reports of violence. And they're really, really amazing to read through and, and frightening. So, on June 7, 1868, 15 individuals who were part of the Ku Klux Klan marched through Milliken firing shots at African-Americans who by some accounts were gathered in a prayer meeting. And I had someone say to me, that seems really early for the Klan. This 1868 is when we first start to see um, records of the Klan. So we know it is this early. It's sort of a proto-Klan, but, it, but it's there. Um, the Klan was spreading through Texas, spurred on by the State Constitutional Congress. Um, because, because whites had been, um, had to take an oath of allegiance to come back into the, to voting rights and to come back into the union. Um, and there was a lot of fear that equal voting rights would be um, supplied to, to black citizens. What was interesting is that Pastor George Edwins Brooks, who was a Methodist preacher at the Millican African Methodist Church, he was a former union soldier, a free press agent, and a union league organizer. 
he led his parishioners into an armed defense. It was sort of a Texas shootout. And the parishioners turned their guns on the Klan, and as you can see, the Klan dropped their robes and ran, which is pretty amazing, right? Um, Randlett, this is a letter from Nathan Randlett, the Freedmen's Bureau um, person I showed you. He documents this in a letter in July 9th. For a long time, people thought this was an apocrypha story, a story that was just told. We know from Randlett's report that this happened. Brooks is a really central figure in the Millikan story, and he's the figure that I want people to learn about. He's a local activist who was murdered for his work to support black citizenship rights. He was so involved in his community. He officiated numerous marriages. Um, and remember that marriage was a legal institution that was banned during slavery. It was denied people's marriage rights and the sanctity of marriage had been denied. And he very quickly was marrying people. We have the lists of his, marriage, um, his marriages that he performed. In response to the Klan's march, even more interestingly, Brooks began to organize black citizens into a militia. They began to march on the green. They began to learn to shoot. He put them into military blocks. They surrounded the black community at night and protected the black community. And as you can imagine, oh, and he even lodged a complaint with the Freedmen's Bureau about the treatment that was occurring. Now, as you can imagine, the white community was not happy about this. And they went to the Freedmen's Bureau and they said, you have to stop the militia exercise and you have to take the weapons from the black community. Um, and Randlett said, I'm not taking weapons from anyone until the Klan disperses. So this is what's sort of churning, as you can see, churning up, up things. Um, by July 15th, a rumor began to spread through the community that a black man, Miles Brown, had been hung on the farm of Andrew Holiday. And we have conflicting names here. It could have been Andrew Holiday. It could have been William, his brother. His name is spelled Holiday or Holiday. But what we do know is they were both white sons of former, the largest plantation owner in, in the area. Um, documentation remains unclear as to which Holiday was at the center of the rumors. But we do know, according to an oral history collected from a local pastor who's a descendant of Brown, that we think, according to his story, that the incident was sparked when Miles Brown went to the Holiday home and said, I've done carpentry work for you. You need to pay me. It wasn't free work. Um, when he knocked at the door, his wife, the Holiday women, answered. And as you can imagine, they were the only ones home. And so they reported that Brown had been disrespectful to them, disrespectful to them, and then of course we know this is a common excuse that launches many a lynching. Um, and of course Brown was rumored to be lynched. However, what's really fascinating is Pastor Greer told us that the family history was that Miles Brown had escaped across the river, gone across the river at night into Washington County and had found a, a local black farmer who kind of took him in and made sure he was okay. My students were fascinated with this. They're so like, well, maybe we can find him in the census. We found him in the census. We could confirm his story. And that's why for me, as someone who's working with community groups, it is so important that we have the stories from the community because the records that are made are generally not telling that story. They're only telling one story. So this to me is the, like, the place where the students can really do some great work. Now this Holiday family, that sort of seems to be the center in some ways of churning up um, the, the violence that, and, and the innuendo and the rumors that lead to the massacre. We know a little bit about them. They were the largest slave owners in the county prior to the Civil War. Samuel Holliday, who was the father to both Andrew and William, we know he migrated to Texas from the Deep South, from North Carolina to Tennessee to Mississippi, and he accrued enslaved people as he came along. Um, during the Yellow Fever outbreak, right, right before the massacre, he died, and he left his sons in a very financially depleted position, both because of the end of slavery and because um, the lands that they had were, um, were becoming further depleted, right? They weren't as, as productive. We also know that Andrew was a former private of C Company of the Texas Cavalry, Confederate Army, and newly returned home to Millican. Interestingly enough, census records indicate that several African Americans in Millican shared the surname Holiday, so we don't know if 
you know, either they were enslaved by the white holidays, which might suggest a long-standing, um, you know, relationship between the two, two groups. Um, we also don't know, and Pastor Greer has given us some information on this, we don't know if there's shared parentage there as well. Um, of course, a common occurrence during slavery. We do know that a man named King Holiday um, was killed during one of the first altercations um, and that he obviously had some sort of relationship to the Holiday family. Now, as tensions rose, a counter rumor began to spread in response to the supposed lynching of Brown. Some whispered that the black militia had seized Holiday and they wanted to lynch Holiday for killing Brown. And I will say that this is a story, not surprisingly, that's a story that goes national. This is a story that's not told, not the story that Pastor Greer knows of his family. It's the story that, as you can see, a mob of Negroes attempt to hang a man, white citizens prevent it, 50 or 60 rioters kill, arrival of the United States soldiers. This goes viral. You can see that the New York Times reports this. Um, and I just want to draw you, I know it's a little hard to see, but the little line at the bottom. So these newspapers are getting sources probably mostly through the Telegraph. Um, it's a little hard to see. My students were shocked. The information came from the Houston Ku Klux Vidette Extra. So the Klan paper is obviously the source they're going to use for this. Um, so there were all these rumors flying that the black militia were going to kill white women and children. Um, some papers report that Reverend Brooks instructed Harry Thomas, another leader among the freedmen, to assemble the group and find Miles Brown dead or alive. Um, other sources indicate that 20 members of the black militia began to move toward the Holiday's home and were joined by another 20 in route. But there's no historical evidence and no oral history that confirms that either Holiday was ever seized by the black militia, nor that there was a rising mob of black folks who were bent on attacking the white community. And of course we know this is often the purported excuse for violence. But this is what goes viral. Here's another, um, here's another paper, and I show you this because it's a little different. This was one of the few black papers in Texas, the Daily Austin Republican. This is the only paper my students have found that, that calls this event a massacre, not a riot. And so again, where are our voices? And students are amazed because they're like, oh, we have to know something about the politics of the paper to understand like their perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would help. Um, so, so basically, this is a tinderbox and it explodes. Violence occurs um, and we end up with somewhere between five and 100 people dead. We don't really know. Um, the, the really sort of horrific thing with this is that the news about these mobs of, of freemen, right, these rumors that were being ginned up, they get back to Milliken about 3 p.m. on July 15th. The mayor, Mayor Weed, and Deputy Sheriff Patillo, they quickly respond by forming a posse, a group of 30 men, and they move to meet the black militia. Um, initially, all seems well, as far as we can tell. Uh, the mayor goes to talk to Harry Thomas, who's the black leader of this particular militia entity. Um, during their discussion, a gun goes off, starts a firefight. Um, again, conflicting documentation over who started this. Um, but we know that Thomas is killed, two other black men. We believe they're Dan Idle and King Holiday are killed. Moses Hardy, another um, member of the black militia, was wounded and died the next day. Um, the gunfire ends quickly. Groups retreat to their home. And by late in the afternoon of July 15th, no, no white person has been killed or injured. By July 15th, the end of the evening, Mayor Wheat issues a call for all able-bodied men in the county to come to Milliken and set up a blockade around town to maintain peace. And in response, an estimated 125 to 500 men, again, we're not sure, get on the train in Bryan around 9 p.m. And um, I've read some conflicting stories on this, but what it appears to be is that when the word goes out, folks in Bryan go through the bars, go through the brothels, and you can imagine what upstanding citizens are sitting in the bar, the bar at 2 p.m. on a weekday. They get these folks and they put them on the train and they make a posse and they send them to Milliken, okay? Um, the train pulls into Milliken at 11 p.m. that night. Newspapers report that the black militia had, had sort of staked out a position around the black community to protect them um, in Freedman's Town and they're patrolling this to protect their citizens from the posse. 
Um, we don't have any documentation of what happened, but I think we can make an educated guess. Um, and more rumors circulated. We have increasing potential numbers of folks that, that died um, during this altercation. And there were rumors that up to 1,000 armed black men had amassed at the river. Now remember, there are only 1,200 people in town. Um, and so an additional 200 men were gathered from Bryan and sent by train to Milliken. So we have these two waves of folks coming in. By 8 p.m. of the third day, Captain Randall Randlett of the Freemansboro finally decided to call in 20 U.S. Cavalry, cavalry soldiers, with 20 more arriving soon from Brenham. And he ordered the white posse to go home after two days. Now, what's clear from other documentation is that this spark, this massacre, didn't just end when the cavalry showed up, that this violence began to spill out across other counties, um, bleeding into other counties with reports of shooting and lynching of freedmen. So to me, this is a really important story that needs to be told. My students have never heard this story. They have no idea of this history, and we need to know about this. Um, we also, um, you know, have some really interesting documentation of a complicated history. So one of the things um, that was spread around after the event was that it was out of control because Captain Randall was a drunk and he never left his room. Um, so the freedman soldier, um, the commander of the freedman soldier apparently didn't do much and it was blamed on drinking. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. Um, Brooks, though, was the leader of the black militia, the leader of the black community. And we do have indication that he was um, captured and horribly tortured and killed. They identified his body several days later. He was identifiable only by his missing right finger and his clothing. He was found in the bottoms and had been missing for days. There's a couple stories, we're not quite sure what happened. Um, one, ad the New Orleans advocate says that he was apprehended on his way to Austin to meet with um, General Reynolds, probably trying to get some support. Um, and the papers reported that the mob, quote, demanded that he should disclose the object of his mission to Austin and that he should recant his Republican principles. Um, and then it goes on in this really horrific way, and I'm not going to re repeat the news story. It's online if you'd like to find it, but they talk about um, how he was killed. And, and that's the other thing, too, that's a struggle with this, this project. These are terrible, horrible histories. What is re-traumatizing? Like, what does it mean? And I'll talk about that a little more, bit more at the end. Um, we, we believe, or at least the, the stories we're told, is that when his body was recovered, the black community was able to get his, his body back, and they buried him near the Brooks Chapel AME Church in Milliken, which is on FM 159, but we don't have a marker, we don't have a site. Um, and I guess if there's one piece of the Milliken story that I want to tell is George Brooks, because he's an amazing civil rights advocate. Um, who we deserve to know about in the same way we know about Medgar Evans. I mean, Evers, I think he's, he's that important to us, especially here in Texas. The other thing to know is, you know, now we sort of think about these events sometimes as isolated, but what's fascinating to me, and the work that my students do have done on this is amazing, newspapers covered this around the world, which is kind of fascinating. French newspapers. Um, it ends up in Panama. I had some students that were going through Spanish language papers and they found the event covered in Panama. Um, San Francisco, New York, Hamburg, Austria. I mean, all over the world, people were interested in this event. Um, in fact, the one, one paper I found particularly interested, <coughs> interesting was this new free press, which is an Austro-Hungarian paper. And, um, you know, I had to poke around. My German's not so good. And, of course, I found someone who could help me translate this paper. And the quote that I always tell people that's so fascinating, they begin their story with a quip that loosely translates as, you may all go to hell, and I will go to Texas. Texas does not seem much better than hell for black people. And it goes on to talk about how Austrians might think about immigrating to Texas and that there is work to do, and they could do the work. And I think that changes the way we think about things in, a, in, a, in an important way. Like, what is it about this story that, that sort of resonates in the Austrian press, like the Austro-Hungarian press? Um, the other thing I found just recently is that this massacre remains a touchstone in national politics into the fall election cycle, with Republicans using it to rouse voters. For example, the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania Telegraph 
runs this, this story on October 12th, and they call for voters to reject the opposition's candidate, Horatio Seymour, quote, who does not rebuke the horrors of New Orleans, Memphis, Milliken, Camilla, and St. Landry. So this is a, an event that's really resonating across the U.S. Now, there were some investigations called after the massacre. Nathan Randall at the Freedmen's Head, he wrote a document. Um, General J.J. Reynolds, the commander of Texas, ordered a military report. Um, good old General McCulloch wrote a letter to the Austin Weekly Star Gazette defending his role in the massacre and blaming the riot on the Freedmen seeking the vote. Um, this journal of the Reconstruction Convention is, is a fascinating story because what it tells us, we loop back to Stephen Curtis again. Remember, he's the, the elected official. My students started to look at this because he's the one that called and pushed for the investigation, and he initially was given credit to go ahead with the investigation. We found out that one of the reasons he might have called for the investigation is because Brooks was a pastor who married he and his wife, so there was a personal connection. Um, and he was able to convince the Special Committee on Lawlessness and Violence to investigate that. Now, what we found out is the report eventually concluded that they would, quote, admit that the colored men were wrong. And that was the report. Curtis was not able to have a legitimate investigation. Um, we do also know, and this is interesting, E.M. Pease, who was um, a governor, a Republican governor of Texas around this time period, um, he writes this letter to his wife, and among the many things he says, he says, there has been a massacre, and he uses that word, of freedmen at Millican and Brazos County. What are, and it's unreadable, what are something call a riot in which Negroes alone were killed? And he attaches additional documents of lynchings. And so this history, this unknown history, is so important. So I want to sort of close this book and this, I've given you a lot of information, is to talk briefly about um, the ways that partnerships have really um, informed this. And this is where I want to say thank you to all my community members. Um, partnerships have made this project possible. This, this story I can tell you is a long fought for story. Historians have not known the story. First, I want to say a thank you to my colleague, Tanisha Taylor, who's at, who was originally at Prairie View. Now she's just down the road at Texas Southern. Um, and I'm sure would be happy to come and chat with folks. Um, she's very close, she's wonderful. So she helped me with this project, initially titled White Violence and Black Resistance, um, which we wrote up in a article for those academics here, if you're interested. Um, here, I want to thank the Camp Town, Texas, 10 counties historical explorers who have done such great work in their own communities and um, let me, your expertise, taught me how to do this work. I wanted to thank you. Um, we were so pleased that you all could come to Texas A&M. I think a few of you will see your picture there. Thank you for coming to Texas A&M and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, we were able to share some of the information we had in our collections and try to give back to, to the community. Um, I wanted to jump back to how important these stories are. I want to talk about Pastor Greer again. Um, my students are enthralled with the stories we're telling. Pastor Greer was an important source for us. I mentioned um, that we found his relative in the census. He told us this other really interesting story. His family history, he said, was that his white ancestor had two sets of sons. There were the black sons who were, whose names were given G-R-E-A-R, -E and the white sons who were G-R-E-E-R. And he said, oh, yeah, I remember a story where, like, he would let them carry guns and, you know, they had more freedom. And I think they got in trouble for it once. We found the court case where his ancestor was fined for allowing his slave to carry a gun off his property. This is Pastor Gers. So this is the kind of work that we learn from oral histories that our students learn from. And, of course, I mentioned, hopefully soon, we will have a, um, we'll have a marker to commemorate. I want to just close with one or two other mentions of community partnerships. I'm going to speed ahead here because I want to make sure we have time to discuss. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about the importance of our institution coming to terms with this. Um, our institution, thankfully, has decided, at least for our yearbooks, that we will not bury the past. And we have made a statement, but we have put all the material in line. A lot of universities, when the blackface scandals came out, pulled their materials down. Cornell University, for one 
pulled their materials down and didn't have an on honest conversation about that. Um, but I want to sort of just end by thinking about the cautions with this kind of work, and I've mentioned it before. Um, there's cautions with this work because when I show you these pictures and tell you these horrible stories, it comes at a cost. Um, and Tania, uh, Tania Sutherland talks about this in her Black Bodies, Social Justice in the Archive. And she reminds us that for black Americans, the spectacle of black death that replays itself without purpose or context is traumatic. So how do we think about creating archives that tell the truth without reinscribing <coughs> violence? Jessica Johnson warns us that the histories of slavery offer digital humanists a cautionary tale, a lesson in the kind of death dealing that happens when enumerating, commodifying, and calculating bodies becomes naturalized. We must, as she says, feel this pain and infuse their work with methodology and practice that centers the descendants of the enslaved, grapples with the uncomfortable, messy, and unquantifiable, and in doing so, refuses disposability. This is the question that I grapple with. How does an archive represent the horror of the lynchings without re-victimizing Brooks? Such questions have become even more central in the midst of the numerous videos documenting the deaths of black Americans, from Eric Gardner to Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Philander Castile, Sandra Brown, Pamela Turner, and Tatiana Jefferson, and so many more whose deaths are played and replayed as viral videos spread across the internet. We must think about this. The final, um, and I look like I'm out of time, the final thing I want to talk about is an archive issue. There's been recent news covering daguerreotypes of enslaved peoples, um, and these daguerreotypes are owned by Harvard. These daguerreotypes were made for Louis Agassiz, and if you know anything about Louis Agassiz, he's basically the biologist who argued for biological racism. So he took these pictures to confirm his ideas about biological racism. The descendants of the enslaved people pictured in these, these pictures, Renty and Delia are the, 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 two, the two folks that are pictured in these images. They're suing Harvard because these images are of their ancestors. They're asking Harvard for return of the images and damages for the profits that Harvard has made on the images. Harvard has licensed these images. They have collected fees. They have collected fees for them to be used in numerous documentaries. And they have profited off of these images. The descendants are taking other steps, that they want the university to acknowledge the complicity of the exploitation of these men and women in the images. So far, Harvard has refused to do all. Um, but they have said that they're not going to um, they're not going to assert copyright, but they're going to continue to own the images. This image I'm showing you of the daguerreotypes, I think, is a, is the way that we manage these situations in archives. The descendants hold the images of their relatives. These are their ancestors. They're holding them. We are not taking those images out of context and re-exploiting them. We are letting the family interpret and honor their ancestors. And I think this case reminds us of how very important it is as scholars to think carefully through the types of materials we're working with and the partnerships we're developing. Because to center the human experience, to rethink our working partnerships with historically marginalized communities necessitates the development of best practices. But we've not yet collectively considered how we might articulate this framework. We academics working on projects have to be willing to seek control from the individual and the academic institution and position the project within the community or activist site. This has generally not been how we've done this. We've generally been very exploitive. This legacy will alter the way we structure our partnerships and should really make us think carefully about ownership, control, and openness. To exploit data is to exploit individuals. The development of an ethics of practice should be developed to guide us through our data selection, our use, and our digitization based on community control. Ultimately, the community must maintain control over its knowledge and to ask that we not look at materials as data or not look at all. Through this open dialogue and careful attention to technological structures, we might begin to find ways to develop rich and equitable partnerships. And thank you so much.